Uh, this is Stephen Del Carteret, right? well uh, uh, <laughs> CTO of Alice 9, which is, what's that? I'm not the CTO. Oh, VP of, so, well, right, si similar, VP of Research and Development for Alice 9. So he has a PhD in biochemistry from Madison, I think, which is where I'm from. So that's the only thing I wanted to tell you about. <laughs> <laughs> Brief and profound, my favorite. Um, <laughs> The, uh, I, I appreciate really that being able to, to come over here for a couple of reasons. One, I've, I've been wanting to know what's been going on here. Uh, you know, there's a connection between Chris, obviously, and LS9. But uh, I, I did my undergraduate here, so just being able to walk around campus uh, just for a little bit this morning or this afternoon. Um, and uh, I got to go to Top Dog, <laughs> which to me is an important thing. So that was, uh, you know, I, I never get to do that. Um, so that was. Uh, I, it's really fun to be here. Um, it's, I love this time of year, you know, when it, where, where it, it's just, you know, it's starting to cool down a little bit, and, you know, I forget how beautiful Berkeley is. Anyway, um, what I'd like to be able to tell you about is work we're doing at LS9. Um, we were founded in 2005, right, and in in about, just about five years ago, and it was founded by Chris and Jay Kiesling and George Church, as well as some venture capitalists uh, that were focused on at the time when ethanol was doing this. Um, well, you know, ethanol is pretty good. It's having a big impact and certainly made uh, Brazil economically uh, independent. But, you know, what with synthetic biology coming, you know, having arrived, you know, what could we do differently and better? And if you're going to, you know, really apply biology and synthetic biology to solving problems, you know, what would you do? And you know the, the 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 basic criteria for success. I think everybody knows it's been said many many times. Um, but if you really wanted to, to achieve rapid and widespread transition to renewables, there were some basic criteria that needed to be met. And those I think everybody here probably has tattooed somewhere or can commit you know say in their sleep. But it you got to be cost competitive, profitable without subsidy. Um, it's got to be scalable. It can't just be academic. You need raw materials that will satisfy that word there, scalable, and this word here, profitable. Um, and ultimately, you want products that are going to be compatible with the existing consumer and, uh, and distribution infrastructure. And um, one of the things that we also, at least one of the things that for me was really important was, can we do this without really any miracles being required? Can you imagine each component of the technology that would be required to get you from A to B? Um, do you believe that each piece with, they never may, may never been put together, but is there each piece relatively low risk? You know, is this, you know, do you know where you're going to get your sugar? Does the organism actually been scaled up? Uh, does the metabolism, does it have a good theoretical yield? Is it fast enough? And is the product truly, you know, can you imagine the chemical steps or biochemical steps from getting to the product you want? And th for me, that was an important one for, you know, do I think I can, you know, Am I going to quit my job and <laughs> and 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 get involved with this, you know, with with, with you know, with LS9? And that was, I think, uh, to me, a, a critical one. So this was really the vision. Um, it was if you want to meet those criteria, uh, you need a process. Um, you need a, a, something that's going to be extremely high yield on your raw material. So if you're going to make a fuel or a commodity chemical, um, the single highest cost is going to be your raw material. And so you need to convert that with high yield into product. Uh, in order to do that, you need a pretty simple process. The more complex your process, the more expensive it is, the more capital you need to put in the ground, more pieces of steel. And uh, if you can put those two things together, then you can enable this low cost. And if you can get to the low cost, then you can scale it. Um, we've also focused on being able to produce you know, diverse products uh, using this technology as well as producing, uh, being able to produce it from a diverse set of feedstocks. You want, you want to be able to, if you really want to have an impact, you don't want to be able to do it in just one place. You want to be able to respond to the geographical opportunities for feedstocks so that you can enable the technology where it's required. So th that was really sort of the vision. Um, this was also the vision. Where we're going to create biology, we're going to create a, 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 a fermentative process where you can take these renewable feedstocks, diverse ones, convert it in a single step into secreted hydrocarbon products that are com compatible, um, that could be separate, separated very, very easily. Um, and in order to do that, this is where synthetic biology came in. 
with the belief that, well, if we know what those chemical steps are, we can use synthetic biology to design and build these catalysts, where we put all the unit operations inside the cell, and that that would enable these simple processes. And what we've aimed at is producing fuels and chemicals, and here's a number that everyone likes to argue about, so I'll, I'll put it up there because it's controversial. Um, $50 a, a, a barrel of oil equivalent at an operating cost. That's not totally loaded, That's, that is you know, an OPEX, variable cost. Um, we've, uh, that's usually something that jumps up there. The, um, so the, the, this is the, the theoretical, this, this, these economics represent the theoretical yield of, of the process, and I'll talk a little bit of, uh, about that. So if you're gonna make products that are drop-in compatible, you're really competing with this stuff here, right, petroleum. Um, if you look in a can of petroleum, you guys probably know this better than, than, even, than, than, than I do, um, there's basically three kinds of molecules. There are aromatics, there are naphtha, and there are paraffins, and the, the fuel molecules really come from all of these, but uh, these here really make up the bulk of at least the diesel molecules, as well as uh, jet fuel and the shorter molecules for gasoline. So um, there's your template. Um, this is metabolism. You've probably seen this before hanging up somewhere. And um, there's you know, tremendous opportunities within metabolism, but if you want to make fuel molecules or hydrocarbons, um, there's a variety of ways of doing it. You've probably heard about these. Um, there's ways to get into butanol or isobutanols that work well in the gasoline pool. Um, there are the isoprenoids, these are hydrocarbons that can be you know, hydrogenated into you know, gasolines, diesel, uh, jet fuels. Um, and then there's a fatty acid species that you know, look more like these long chain paraffins. Um, so when we got involved, we sort of modeled a lot of these things. We're really focused here. Uh, one, because it was the only route to make long chain saturated hydrocarbons, and it had the best theoretical yield for making those. So um, this is one of the, if you look, think about fatty acid metabolism, uh, there's a lot of reasons to like it and to choose it. Uh, fatty acid metabolism um, has a extremely high theoretical yield for, uh, for making hydrocarbons when it comes to biology. So it's about as good as it gets. It's similar to ethanol in, a, in an energetic yield. It's about 90% theoretical energetic yield. Uh, depending on the product, the theoretical maximum yield is somewhere between 30 and 37, depending on the product that you make. And again, the, the amount of oxygen that's in that molecule or the chain length is gonna have an impact on the, on the mass yield. When I say theoretical yield, I mean grams of product divided by grams of, of sugar. Um, one of the advantages of fatty acid metabolism uh, and one of the challenges is that it's primary metabolism. So this is metabolism that the cell needs to grow and it uses it, to, it's, part of the, it's part of the cell. The advantage is that because it's you know, bricks and mortar of the cell, it, um, it, it, it's very efficient. Uh, it's also very fast. So if you think about E. coli, if you guys have grown E. coli in the lab, E. coli will double in about 30 minutes, right? E. coli is about 10%, 9.7%, 9%, depending on who you ask, lipid. So if you do the back envelope calculation on the volumetric productivity, it's about 0.3 grams per liter per hour per gram dry cell weight. That's fast. If you have a, a process that's got 10 grams per liter of cells, a biocatalyst, then that's giving you three grams per liter per hour per gram dry cell weight, that, or a volumetric productivity. That's already pretty good. You only need two. Ethanol is about two. And so just to, again, no miracles required, just to grow, E. coli naturally shovels and pumps carbon through this pathway at a, a commercial productivity. Our challenge is to harness that and pull it into the products that we want, because we don't want to make lipid. We want to make diesel. We want to make you know, uh, diff different products, and I'll talk about those in a second. Um, it's also extremely well characterized. It's a very well characterized pathway, um, and uh, that we have tools that we can use quickly. Um, and even though I've drawn it here as a nice straight chain fatty acid that has this nice chemical group that, we, that the cell uses to eat from, that we can use it to do chemi chemistry on, um, there's also a tremendous amount of structural diversity for a relatively boring you know, molecule. You can have different saturation, branching, chain length. Um, and our ability to control that gives us an opportunity to make a diversity of other products. So uh, this is fatty acid metabolism. For those of you who don't know about it, um, it, it, sugar comes in the front door, and ultimately you break it down to what I like to call uh, biological ethylene, um, which is the two-carbon unit uh, acetyl-CoA. And from this, the cell can build just about everything. Um, you also produce uh, biological hydrogen, NADH or NADPH, uh, energy in the form of ATP, and you blow off some CO2. 
this acetyl-CoA is then um, is activated using ATP um, to, to malonyl-CoA, so you add this uh, uh, CO2 to make a malonyl-CoA. That's transferred to a malonyl ATP, which is the, uh, a protein molecule that's then used as a substrate donor for fatty acid uh, biosynthesis. Um, this is condensed for the first step with an acetyl-CoA to get a beta-keto uh, beta -keto thioester, and then hydrogen in the form of NADPH, or NADH, again, coming from sugar, is uh, hydrogenates this double bond to give you the beta-hydroxy uh, th thioester. You then dehydrate that down to this uh, enoyl uh, 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 thioester, and then this is then reduced, again, using biological hydrogen that originated from sugar down to the saturated hydrocarbon, and this just goes around in a circle, okay? Um, and then as you grow two carbons at a time, you have the opportunity after the fifth condensation to introduce a cis double bond. And a, one of the advantages of microbial fatty acid metabolism, as opposed to, say, eukaryotic fatty acid metabolism, is that you only produce one. You either produce monos, unsaturate, or saturated molecules. And there's an advantage there because of the, uh, the instability of polyunsaturates. They're great nutritionally, but as a fuel molecule, they're kind of a problem. They're oxidatively unstable. Uh, they have good cold flow, but they have low cetane. Um, so being able to have only one or nothing is actually a good thing when it comes to designing fuels. Um, so that's fatty acid metabolism. I'm going to condense that down to this arrow here. Um, and that's really the, in, the, the metabolism that we're working on. We're, we're engineering that, and we're taking it and, and, and diverting it into new products. Something to remember is that fatty, uh, within, inside the cell, fatty acids are, um, it's not just a single molecule. Uh, this ACP is the most abundant protein in the cell. And that protein, and so as fatty acids are, are synthesized, you're producing a distribution of fatty acids in, you know, of two, four, six, eight, you know, different, different chain links that are inside the cells. If you just said freeze and looked inside the cell, it wouldn't just get this one or just this one. There'd be a distribution. And that's actually useful to us as well, because now this is, uh, instead of having just one chain link to choose from, we can choose from a variety of different chain links that we can you know, pull into different products. The, the cell likes to pull off generally the, you know, the 14, 16, 18s into lipids or uh, you know, into, into membranes, lipid A. But these other ones exist. And we can access those uh, if we want to using you know, metabolic engineering. As these things build up inside the cell, as uh, the cell stops needing them, they start slowing down the growth, they, they act as an inhibitor, a feedback inhibitor to this pathway, um, which is important. I'll tell you why, why that's important later. But uh, that's how the cell, is one of the, the ways the cell regulates fatty acid metabolism. And by the way, interrupt me in the middle of the seminar and ask a question if you want to. I'm here for you guys, not for me. So if you got a question, you don't understand something, or you want to ask, just interrupt, just ask the question. That's, Please do. Uh, I'm, more, I'm more comfortable with that. Um, so with that as the biochemist, the na native pathway inside of, uh, of a cell, and we, we mainly focus on, on microbes and E. coli, we also have a diversity of chemical unit operations that we can then add to that to build new compounds. Um, these are just some of the many, many, many different types of chemistry that you can do um, that exist in biology. And as you choose the right ones, you can find the genes and assemble new pathways um, that can convert, you know, given intermediates inside the cell, a uh, step at a time into different products. And again, each one of these things, if you think about it, is really a chemical unit operation. If you had to do this, you know, in a, a, industrially, each one of these genes would represent, you know, a huge tank, you know, hundred, you know, tens of millions of dollars of, 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 uh, of, of capital and loss of yield and, and, and a challenge to, 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 to engineer. Whereas the cell does this all day long, and they just string them together. So the key is having these things that work well together, and the challenge is engineering them uh, uh, correctly. And that's really what synthetic biology uh, allows us to believe we can do, <laughs> right? And that, because um, we definitely know how to find these, how to stitch them together, then the challenge is optimizing. So that's what, we, what, what, we've, what we've done at LS9, really, is divide, uh, de designed a, a a, a really a platform that allows us to improve the flux of, 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 uh, of, of or I shouldn't say improve it, the flux is already pretty good, but to control the flux of carbohydrate through fatty acid metabolism, and then control the, the, the size, the branching, the saturation. Um, you know, we've been able to diverse, diverse chemistries and products. And the way we do it is to introduce new pathways, such as those ones I talked about earlier. Um, when we turned out we were able to secrete these products, I'll talk about that a little bit later, uh, into a diversity of products, not all shown here, but these are ones that we've actually talked about. So uh, we can make fatty acids, 
obviously. Um, fatty esters, these are the components of biodiesel. Fatty alcohols, uh, components of, of surfactants. Alkanes, sort of the, the holy grail in producing you know, biofuels. Um, these are also good chemical intermediates. Um, aldehydes, uh, internal ketones, olefins, uh, terminal olefins, and a variety of other things. So these are, I'm going to talk about, I can't talk about all of them. I'm going to talk mainly about, th these are the ones that we've focused on commercially at LS9. Um, but we've got, uh, I'll talk a little bit about some of the fun science that's been involved in the discovery and the building of, of, these, of these pathways. So when we first got going, um, you know, we, we were, our goal was to make hydrocarbons, make alkanes. It had been recognized that in nature, cells, biology makes hydrocarbons. They make it in a diversity of ways, but no one really knew how it was made, how they were made. Uh, it wasn't really known, um, you know, no, no genes were directly associated. They've ever been actually isolated and were commonly used to produce uh, hydrocarbons uh, from fatty acid, uh, the fatty acid pathway. So this was, a, this was really our, what we set out to do. And we did some other things at the same time. Um, but I'll take you through some of the, the science that we did uh, to, to discover these. So uh, if you look in nature, uh, you, you find the alkanes, uh, which, is one of the, which is really what we were focused on right off the bat. Um, but as you look for other hydrocarbons uh, that look as though they were de derived from fatty acid metabolism, there were uh, there was the terminal olefins and these internal olefins where you cells that had uh, pro chemicals uh, and hydrocarbons that always had an internal olefin, but were sometimes di or tri olefinic. So suggesting that they were produced by the condensation of, of, the, of, of fatty acids that were either saturated or unsaturated. So we really set out to find, to figure out how, how biology made these, all of them, um, and begin to make them and see if we could use them. The first one we, uh, we started, really started working on, or we're, well, I should say we're successful with, um, were these internal olefins. Uh, they're made in, in a variety of gram-positive and gram-negative organisms. Um, we, uh, we started working on an organism called uh, Stenotropomo Stenotropomonas multifilia. That was, an, uh, it was previously named as a pseudomonas. Um, it made a diversity of these sort of 31, they're odd chain, uh, straight and branched, mono, di, and tri olefins. And basically what we did is set up a, a high throughput screen that just looked for the production of these compounds. And we did transposon mutagenesis and uh, looked, for, looked for mutants that were knocked out in the capability of making the, uh, these compounds. And what we discovered pretty quickly was a new metabolic pathway that uh, was a four gene pathway that was responsible for the production of this. We, you know, d dug into the genome. We had a sequence of, of the genome. Once we hit the, hit the uh, once we were able to sequence out from the transposon, we identified these four open reading frames, were able to clone them into E. coli, and recombinantly produce these compounds uh, in relatively short order. We've done some uh, biochemistry that we've talked about, and others as well, um, ha have, have also now uh, identified these genes. And the way we, uh, we the, our understanding of the biochemistry of this pathway is that the first enzyme, this OLA-A, it has a homology to the to the uh, to Fab H, so or or thiolase, and I think it looks pr more likely like a thiolase than it is a Fab H. It's not a uh, it's a it's a non decarboxylative uh, glycine condensation. So it takes two thioesters, and uh, will produce uh, this beta keto um, or alpha alkyl beta keto thio, uh, thioester. This is obviously a thermodynamic uphill reaction. It's not a downhill reaction. If, you, if this was a de, if this was a malonyl CoA where you decarboxylate it, then it'd be a, you'd have the driving force of decarboxylation, but you don't. So this is an uphill reaction. If you express OLA-A by itself, that's what we call this first enzyme. Um, interestingly enough, you produce a whole bunch of secreted um, internal ketones. This is, these are like C27, C29, C31. Uh, internal ketones. So we don't know exactly the chemistry here, but we believe that you likely just hydrolyze this thioester and it spontaneously or you know, somehow decarboxylates to give you this, this beta ketone, this, this internal ketone. But it's an interesting molecule because this is a chemical handle that you can do some interesting chemistry with. Um, if you want to make these internal olefins, you need the rest of the pathway, or at least A, C, and D. Uh, and we, we're not sure exactly what, uh, what, what C does, uh, but we do know that D is a, uh, is, is a uh, oxidoreductase that reduces this beta ketone into the, into the alcohol. And then the, the rest of the biochemistry we're, we're still working on. Um, we've got some ideas whether you, whether you uh, activate this or you, you know, again, you, you dehydrate, de de decarboxyl dehydration. We're not really sure, um, but it's, it's a good opportunity for some biochemistry and people are working on it. Now what's interesting here is, is that since you're bringing these two molecules together, uh, it turns out that this enzyme 
conveys some selectivity to the chain length of these two molecules, which depending on which organism you isolate that gene, you will see different, uh, different compositions of, uh, of product. And it, they actually have different selectivities. And so we actually showed, um, or Lisa Friedman and her team um, were able to show that the, depending on what you feed the, 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 the cells or what you feed this, the, the, um, which enzyme you use in vivo, uh, or what you are able to feed to the enzyme in vitro, you can produce a diversity of, of interesting products and basically take that double bond and move it around. So if you have a C4 plus a C16, you can put the double bond you know, between the, the, the three and the, and the 16 position, and you can sort of move it around, right? And you can have shorter chain lengths to longer chain lengths. And these shorter chain lengths, you can get down into the C17s. You're starting getting down to that diesel range, which is pretty interesting. But uh, it, you know, it, this is sort of playing around, but you can produce some very, very interesting compounds with different branching, saturation, uh, and chain link components, which gives you opportunities in, 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 uh, in, in lubricants, fuels, et cetera. Um, another uh, pathway we looked into were these terminal olefins. So we started looking for, for hydrocarbons. There's a variety of the eukaryotes produce these terminal olefins, uh, which again are, are really interesting compounds uh, you know, as industrial chemicals down the well, compounds uh, in polyethylenes, et cetera. Um, and, and, and intermediates in, in different surfactant production. Most of them were, were identified in eukaryotic organisms. Um, however, uh, Andreas and Matthew recognized that there were also some um, microbes that produced these. And these microbes produced the, you know, again, would look like fatty acid derived chain lengths, um, from like C18 to C20. Um, and what they did was they, they looked at, uh, they isolated this organism and uh, began to you know, feed it free fatty acids. And they could see if you fed it a free fatty acid, you would increase the level of, of product of these terminal olefins. So they then cracked open the cell. And when they fed that, that, that fatty acid, they were also able to see in vitro this apparent decarboxylation. And you know, so if you feed the free fatty acid, you don't make the, the non-adexine. Um, the cell itself, the background doesn't have it, but together you were able to, to produce this you know, cell and fatty acid dependent production uh, of one non-adexine. So this provided a biochemical assay that we were able to use to uh, then trace and purify the protein. So this is a completely different approach to finding the genes. The first one was genetically trying to knock it out. Genetics for Geogallococcus aren't very good. Um, so here was an opportunity to just purify the protein. And so what they did is they used that assay to purify the protein. They got down to two, two bands. And then simultaneously, you can tell this is an old slide, right? You know, we were able to sequence the genome in, in two weeks, right? That's yeah, boring today. Yeah, we, we were really excited about it. You, know, you can do it, you can do it in, <laughs> in, the, in an afternoon now, right? Uh, but three years ago, four years ago, two weeks, that was pretty incredible. Um, so by, by the time we sent this off to get uh, some in-terminal sequencing, or actually we took, did trips and digest and looked at the mass spec fragments, we were able to then uh, assign the different fragments to different genes, open reading frames within the, in, within the Geogallococcus genome. And that identified quickly this one open reading frame. Um, this one we couldn't assign, but this open reading frame turned out to be a, an analog of a fatty acid uh, hydroxylase, looked more like an alpha hydroxylase. Um, but if you take that gene and ex it now express it in E. coli, uh, we're able to then enable E. coli to directly produce um, it, one, if we fed free fatty acids um, to the cell, we were able to produce this uh, hexadecene, so we feed C18, and we could produce the C17-1 hexadecene, which was the, uh, or heptadecene. Um, and if you then express in E. coli uh, that's producing free fatty acids, so if you express the thioesterase, for example, um, you could produce just from sugar directly these hydrocarbons, uh, these, these terminal ovens. Turns out the, this is a P450. Uh, it's homologous to a lot of the fatty acid hydroxylases. You can sort of see where, they, where it lies. Here it is, here. Um, and um, you know, it, it's, a, uh, it's a pretty interesting, uh, it, it, it turns out that if you, if the, it, it looks a lot like the, the, the alpha and beta hydroxylases, but it has a different active site. Normally these things have a histidine, and this one has a glutamine, and we've been able to now take beta hydroxylases and convert them into, uh, into terminal olefin producers, and these will produce, a, it has a little bit of a side shunt activity. We're starting to get a little bit better understanding of the biochemistry, and we should have a paper coming out in that pretty soon. So, um, but what we're really looking for ultimately were these alkane producing uh, or, uh, genes. Uh, alkanes are produced, you know, in a variety of, of organisms, you know, from, you know, again, from all walks, <coughs> crawls, slithers of life. 
Um, the, the probably best studied ones were coming from, from the, the algae as well as pea and, and some bugs. Um, and uh, this fellow, uh, Kalata Cuddy, uh, who's at Ohio, is now at University of Florida, or Florida, Florida State, um, discovered that there were these cobalt porphyrin enzymes that would uh, catalyze the, the decarbonylation of aldehydes. And he would see this in, in cell extracts, but it was very difficult. They tried to clone the genes for, uh, for a while, but it was difficult because of the, uh, the, you know, they, they could identify the, clone the, purify the, the protein, but apparently they're never getting internal sequences that was, may have been formulated. But they were ever, never able to identify those genes. There were some, uh, there was also some discovery that uh, there was a P450 based decarbonylation or decarboxylation of fatty aldehydes. <laughs> Again, no genes ever discovered. Uh, there was some uh, indirect evidence of Rabidopsis um, where the SIR1 Right, SIR1 uh, was, you know, when it was knocked out, had a decrease in, or an increase in the production of aldehyde, decrease in the production of, of hydrocarbons, but it was never actually showed recombinantly to, to result in the production of, 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 hydro, of hydrocarbons. And then there was the, uh, the ever mystical uh, Vibrio fernicii, uh, which was a microorganism uh, that was believed to produce, uh, reduce a fatty alcohol into an alkane, uh, which is just, when you think about it from a, if you're a chemist and you look at this, you go, Man, that's hard. <laughs> There's a big thermodynamic barrier between here and here. Um, and it turns out that at least this turned out to be a dog that didn't hunt um, in, in many states. So they, the, all uh, attempts to reproduce this turned out to, to, to not be true. So you know, maybe there's something like this in nature. Uh, if anyone can do it, nature can do it. Hasn't been reproduced. Um, what, uh, again, on, uh, Andreas and Matthew discovered was that Hydrocarbons and alkanes are also made in a diversity of cyanobacteria. Um, they, if you look into the cyanobacterial mats, just about you know, most of the ones evaluated, they also produce these alkanes. Um, and so again, we always, if we can work with bacteria or, my, or prokaryotes, we will, because uh, it's generally, generally easier to work with. So they, they evaluated a diversity of these cyanobacteria, brought them in house and looked at which ones, they were very careful this time, they wanted to confirm all reports that things actually made the hydrocarbons since they were hunting after things that didn't in, in the past. Um, and it turned out that of all the ones they evaluated, there was this one that didn't. Um, it, it made hydrocarbons, but it didn't make alkanes. It actually turned out to make terminal olefins. Um, and so the, the, they figured that, well, if this one doesn't have it, then this, these things must have genes that this one doesn't have. And so if you can do a, you know, use a comparative genomic approach, you ought to be able to whittle down at least which genes you know, may be responsible. And so that's what they did. Uh, if you looked at the, the about 10 genomes that produced these and, and this one that did not, um, you're pretty quickly able, once you get rid of all of known genes and central metabolism, et cetera, you were able to whittle it down pretty quickly to about 10 unique genes that had no identified function. And if you looked at those 10, it became pretty, you know, pretty obvious, or at least we felt pretty obvious, that uh, there was a, you know, two genes that sit next to each other. There was a reductase and an enzyme that looked like uh, uh, ribonucleotide reductase, you know, which is a sort of radical-based chemistry, which is what you'd anticipate for a decarbonylation reaction. It's, a, it's, a, it's likely going to be a homolytic cleavage, and, um, and that's, the kind of, that's the kind of enzyme we were suspecting to find. And when we saw these two together, uh, and the fact that it was sitting right upstream of acetyl-CoA carboxylase, so, so a, a, a ACCA, which is uh, an essential gene, made us wonder, maybe this is why we had such a hard time doing transposon mutagenesis of this cell, because we, you know, if they were, we couldn't tell if they were linked or not, but we, we felt that maybe because it was sitting right here next to this essential gene, we weren't able to very effectively you know, identify these, uh, you know, the, 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 these two genes. But when we saw this, this was a really exciting time uh, for us. You know, we, we found this, we were like, this has got to be it. Uh, we, ordered primers, we amplified the gene, we filed a patent that night. <laughs> you know, it, was, it was that fast. Um, and um, within a couple of days, we had amplified, you know, oligos show up pretty quickly, we were able to get it in and show recombinant production in E. coli very quickly um, that those two genes were necessary and sufficient, or they were sufficient in E. coli to produce directly from sugar, um, you know, the, the C13 to, to C17. Um, you know, alkanes and alkenes re resulting from the decarbon, you know, what apparently, you know, we felt was the uh, reduction and decarbonylation of, of fatty acyl ACP. Um, what was also really, you know, fortunate luck for us was this, uh, within the same week, um, when we were blasting the, the, the gene and looking at other, you know, what other homologs there were, 
turns out there was this home log that had a crystal structure associated with it. We're like, what? You know, somebody had solved the crystal structure of this? It turns out it was a, uh, the, 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 there was a, a uh, functional genomics project at MIT that was involved in uh, ca you know, looking at all the crystal structures of all the proteins of Prochlorococcus pro pro marinus. Um, and they had just you know, taken this gene, thrown it in E. coli, overexpressed it, crystallized it, and it was available on the, on, online you know, of this three-dimensional crystal structure with a fatty acid co-crystallized in the active site. So, you know, think how much time you normally try to get, get this kind of information. So within a week, we went to, how does, how does biology make alkanes to having a gene recombinant production and a three-dimensional crystal structure with a uh, co-crystallized uh, fatty acid in the active site? It was a really exciting week. <laughs> that was a good week for LS9. Um, interestingly, that, that fatty acid was, was, uh, it was reported as polyoxygen, right? It wasn't carbon, it was, <laughs> it was poly, it was just, you know, somebody just, a computer had generated this thing, no one had really looked at it. So um, that, was, that was really interesting. It turns out that the, the enzyme does look a lot like uh, ribonucleotide reductase. Um, it belongs to the, the, the non-heme diiron um, class of enzyme, and it's a new reaction for this pretty, pretty powerful uh, class of enzymes that do really cool chemistry. So we then, you know, we, so this is now what this, this pathway looks like. So if we engineer in to E. coli, you know, this alkane pathway, it's just a two enzyme pathway. Um, we've done some now biochemical characterization of the two enzyme. Uh, it prefers fatty acyl ACP. It'll take fatty acyl CoA and reduces that with uh, biological hydrogen and NDPH to form a fatty aldehyde. If you, if you, just, uh, if you express this enzyme alone, you will produce uh, you'll, detectable fatty alkaloid and a lot of fatty alcohol. It's actually a great way to make fatty alcohol because the cells naturally reduce that fatty aldehyde into an alcohol, um, and it produces it at, at really high levels. Um, if you then co-express the two enzymes, uh, you will produce you know, these straight chain alkanes, or it's, depending on, on the temperature, et cetera, that's affecting the saturation, these internal olefins. So these are pretty good molecules. Um, we've actually now, uh, scaled this up to the pilot plant. We've made gallons of this material, had it evaluated. It actually straight up produces, you know, this material that comes out of there meets D975. Uh, it's not the perfect, you know, you're probably going to want better cold flow, et cetera, but it's a good diesel one, number one. Uh, you know, more likely a blend stock, but it's, it meets the ASTM qual uh, qualifications. And as far as I know, I like being, I don't know of another process I'm aware of. Uh, I'm happy to hope people can tell me I'm either right or wrong. It's the only example I'm aware of for a single step ambient uh, conversion of uh, sugar to fuel grade alkanes uh, without the use of hydrogen. It's a one step process. We don't have to take it and then isolate it and then hydrogenate it. It's the, only, it's the simplest process. And that's really what we've been all about uh, at LS9 is how do we keep it simple with the, high, with the highest yield. So this is obviously a, a pretty important project for us now that we're, we're scaling up. While we were doing that, we also, we were spent a lot of time hunting for these genes, uh, doing the intellectual property around them. Um, you know, we, our, our investors weren't gonna be, uh, weren't happy with us just hunting for genes. And, and for, the great thing about fatty acid metabolism is that there are a lot of products out there today derived from, if you look at the oleochemistry, oleochemical market, um, plant oils go into a lot of things. And there were a lot of other chemical opportunities that we could, we could pursue um, using known chemistry, known enzymes. And uh, the obvious one in the fuel area is biodiesel, which is a fatty acid methyl ester. Um, I think everyone here probably understands the challenges associated with, with uh, vegetable oil or, or animal oil ba based uh, biodiesel. Um, limited land supply, there's only so much of this you, you're gonna make. Uh, there's very challenging economics. The, 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 the variation in performance uh, is a big concern to engine manufacturers. Because um, you don't know, you know batch to batch, it, you may get different levels of, of oxidative stability, cold flow, et cetera. And so having a uniform uh, supply is, is really important. So th these, were, these were issues. Um, and so we figured, well, you know, making this ought to be relatively, if, you know, making an alkane is hard. Making this is relatively simple. That's, that's, making ester is pretty straightforward bio, you know, biological chemistry. So we uh, looked at how we might do that. Um, and we built this pathway here. Uh, it's, uh, you know, the first step was involved, we, we looked at making uh, fatty acyl, uh, you know, hy hydrolyzing fatty acyl ACP to, fatty acid, to a fatty acid. 
Uh, the first step was a, in cloning in a thioesterase. This is, you know, old biochemistry uh, in, in, in plant uh, fatty acid biology. Uh, in plants, they've shown that if you express different thioesterases from different plants, you can change the, the oil composition or the chain link composition. Um, but in, 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 in bacteria, if you, if you express a thioesterase, you basically cleave this fatty acyl ACP and you produce a tremendous amount of fatty acid um, for a couple of reasons. One, uh, it's thermodynamically favorable. So uh, whereas the cell is normally making esters over here, uh, hydrolyzing that ester it, it gives you a lot of thermodynamic driving force. It's kinetically favorable uh, for the same reason. Um, but also remember, I told you earlier, when these, these molecules begin to build up inside the cell, they feed back, inhibit the synthesis of this. So when you hydrolyze this and produce this, you're deregulating fatty acid metabolism in the cells. The cell goes, oh my god. I need, I'm running out of fatty acyl ACP, how am I gonna make my membrane? And they open up this, they deregulate and open up this pathway even more, which is important. I have a question, since you said we can run. Yeah, please. It seems like you went to all this work to make the superior product, and now you're making the inferior product. What, just, can you go over it? So it's, it's, all, it's, all, it's all about timelines. We started the company at the same time, and we started looking for the how cells make alkanes, right, and how they make all these hydrocarbons. But we, did, we hadn't found them yet. Oh, so, so this, is, this, is, this, this is not It's a parallel activity. Oh, okay. Right. And, and so, you know, we, we actually made the, this, these molecules from, from uh, the cell way before we ever discovered how to make hydrocarbons. Or I wouldn't say way before, a few months before. Um, but there's no reason why you would want to use molecules like this if you had access to the other ones. So that's what my question is. Uh, yeah, I mean. Uh, well, th th that's, that's, that's debatable, actually. That's debatable. But the, um, you know, the, these are biodegradable. <laughs> there's, some good, there's some good characteristics of biodiesel. It, it, it gets poo-pooed because of classic biodiesel. The biodiesel we're making, I don't even like to call it biodiesel, the fatty acid methyl esters or ethyl esters that we make are really high quality. It's the best stuff anyone's seen. So um, th there's, there's some other value here. Um, the theoretical yield on this pathway is 37%. Now, the energetic yield, it's, it's going to be a wash, right? Um, versus an alkane, which is going to be about 30%. So volumetrically, you can still get a diesel molecule at a higher you know, yield. You know, and, and some people only care about volume, right? Oh, I'm going to get more ethanol than I am diesel, so I'd rather have more volume. You know, so there, there, there's value there. Uh, and, and it, it kind of goes on. But you're fundamentally right. If you could make alkanes, it's more fungible than this. And that's the key reason you want to make hydrocarbons. Um, we focused, we, we, we didn't just make this, and we, when we first made this, um, when we finished the pathway, but it didn't just make it, it made a lot. It was, we, you know, it, it was a sort of like falling off a lot. We thought, okay, our first organism is going to make 1%, theory, you know, 1 yield, and it was like 5 or 10% yield without trying. You know, so, oh, wow, that's, you know, <laughs> that's pretty good. We were already making progress, so we, it gave us a, a product to start scaling up. So it, it had a lot less risk at that point, and it's an item of commerce. That's why we pursued it. Um, the next step in the pathway was, so normally if you make fatty acids inside the cell, uh, this is french fries. These, these, the, the, the cell will, will like to eat these. So we, I don't show here. We've also knocked out the fatty acid degradation pathway um, so that this is maintained, doesn't get eaten. Um, and then you ex overexpress this enzyme here, the fatty acyl CoA synthetase. It's actually the first enzyme in fatty acid uh, degradation. You activate it to a CoA, and then you start doing beta, hydro uh, beta, beta oxidation. But the, um, we overexpress this enzyme to form the, reform this fatty acyl CoA, a little bit of waste of ATP. We recognize that. And then you express an acyl transferase that'll catalyze the, the transfer of this fatty acyl group onto really any alcohol that you provide it. So you can produce ethanol inside the cell. You can feed it methanol outside the cell, or ethanol outside the cell, or isopropanol, or isobutanol, or whatever this is. These cells naturally make long chain waxes, um, but if they don't have another substrate, and you provide them a preferred substrate, they will form these fatty acid ethyl or methyl esters very, very efficiently. And we thought we were going to need to engineer secretion. We didn't have to. The cells naturally secrete these products. And um, we don't know. I would like to tell you we knew how and that we did it. We're really smart, that we, we, we you know, we're crafty about how we did this. The cells did it for us. Um, so we're, we're, we're appreciative. Um, if you look at where fatty esters go um, today, fatty esters, are, are, they are used in biodiesel, as you know. Um, they're also uh, an intermediate in the production of fatty alcohol. So if you go to Sacramento and you look at the Procter & Gamble plant there, 
uh, they make uh, fatty alcohols as a precursor to a diversity of surfactants that goes into just about everything you see in your bathroom or uh, <coughs> washroom. Uh, soaps, Tide, dish detergent, shaving cream, toothpaste. It's, you know, we've all, we, 15% of a lot of those things comes from this molecule here. Uh, today it's, it's produced primarily from coconut and palm kernel oil. Um, and what they do is they make biodiesel. They do a transesterification to make this fatty ester and then they hydrogenate this methyl ester. And this is not an easy hydrogen. This is a forced hydrogenation. You're hydro, hydro, hydrogenating an ester down to this alcohol. Um, uh, I've actually seen these, these uh, they're, they're playing, this is a very, very thick walled, <laughs> you know, catalytic process. Um, so we're like, hey, you know, making fatty alcohols, cells make fatty alcohols. Chris showed how to make fatty alcohols a long time ago using ACR1. Um, you know, wh why would you do this? If we can make esters, we ought to be able to make fatty alcohols directly. And this is one of the founding concepts of, of LS9. Um, and so uh, what we did is went and, you know, taking this, that, the same pathway, but just exchanging out that last acyl transferase in, in the pathway for fatty acyl uh, CoA reductase, we were able to make fatty alcohols. Uh, and, and these also were pretty, pretty effective. We've since, uh, we just, a new patent came out. It turns out that we actually, there's another enzyme that does this chemistry, takes a fatty acid and will, de uh, will re activate and reduce it. It's called a carboxylic acid reductase. Turns out to do this very, very well as well. To take fatty acids, it uses uh, ATP and NADPH and a single enzyme will take you down to fatty alcohol and, and it works very well. Um, and as I said earlier, the first enzyme in, um, in alkane biosynthesis, the fatty acyl ACP reductase, will go directly from here down to your, actually the intermediate here, fatty, fatty aldehyde, which then gets reduced inside the cell to fatty alcohol. So we've got a variety of ways of, of making fatty alcohol. Um, one of the things I told you earlier, right, was that we also, um, it's not just the chemistry here that we're concerned about, um, but we also want to control the, the composition of the, these molecules and how they perform. Uh, so, so we just don't want to be stuck like biodiesel with whatever comes out of the, out of the field you know, this season, but rather we want to really engineer exactly the, the composition. Um, and so bioesterase technology is, again, was, was shown in plant biology to be very effective. And so we wanted to leverage that insight um, to control the composition of our products as well. And the, uh, what we've created is a large library of these thioesterases, and we screened them and been able to identify a diversity of ones that basically give us different chain links. This is, these are, this is a pretty old slide, but it just shows you that, you know, depending on the different uh, thioesterase that you, you know, plug in to these pathways as a first step, you can control of that, port of that you know, you've got you have this, uh, this, you know, smorgasbord of different acyl ACPs that you can choose from. This thioesterase is selective. You can engineer the selectivity there to choose which ones you want and to pull into that pathway. And what you end up with is sort of a, you know, I don't know how many chemical engineers we have in here, more than I realized when I started talking to you guys. But it's, it's very similar to a, to, a, to a kinetic resolution, right? You've got this dynamic and you can selectively pull off what you want and then the cell keeps producing up to that point. It's like a, it's like a you know, stealing off of, a, off of an assembly line. And the, uh, what we've, you know, we now can control the different, different compositions. And so uh, th this actually turns out, these two actually turn out to be very, very nice uh, fatty acid methyl esters or ethyl esters. Uh, we've been aiming at things that look a lot like coconut oil based uh, 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 biodiesel. Um, I was gonna, actually was gonna bring some and I, 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 what I can tell you is if you ever come by, welcome to come by LS9, I'll show you the stuff. You can smell it. Um, if, if you smell biodiesel, you get down in the corner here in, 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 uh, in Berkeley from you know, potato chip oil. It's got this sort of heavy, rancid smell, and this has been sitting around for like a year or so. And ours is this, it's really light. It smells good. Almost, it's, I think it's probably got some sort of pineapple, really light esters that come out, and it's, it's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> it's an added benefit. Fill up with our stuff, you know, and you're, you know, your, your Humvee is going to sm smell like a pineapple. Um, the, uh, <laughs> Anyway, um, th that technology also works for fatty alcohol. Um, so again, it doesn't matter whether it's an, an ester pathway, an al alcohol pathway, an olefin pathway. Um, we, we can ha have the same similar, uh, similar control. Um, C12, C14 alcohol is a really important product. Uh, it's the, that's the major fatty alcohols produced that you get out of uh, palm kernel and, uh, and, and coconut. And it's what the, the key ones for surfactants. Um, so, you know, again, we've built the, this, this, tech, this platform technology that allows us to pretty, you know, 
there's exchangeable parts, and it, and it really does work this way. You know, depending on the pathway, you can just, with a few steps, you can make alkanes, you can switch out different pathways to make alcohols, esters, olefins, and we've got other products that we haven't talked about that, again, it's very, very modular. Um, but that's pretty academic, again, <coughs> neat. We can make the products. You know, this is what we're looking at. We, we, we need to make diesel, right? If we're focused on diesel, um, that's a relatively inexpensive product. We make a lot of it. Um, the reason we focused on diesel uh, is that it's, you know, domestically we focus on gasoline, but globally this is the biggest demand. If you look at uh, gasoline demand over time versus diesel demand, diesel is going up, and that's driven by China, it's driven by India, it's driven by a developing nation, because if you want to develop, you need heavy equipment, and you don't run heavy equipment on gasoline. Uh, you don't run it on ethanol, you're not going to run it on electricity requires diesel, so heavy, these heavy equipment that, that's involved in development requires diesel, and as they, these you know, billions of people begin to develop more and more, this demand goes up. It, it is, there's a thirst for it. If you can make diesel, you can, get it, you can sell it. Um, so we anticipate this demand to, to, to continue. And so as, as a small company trying to make something that there was demand for, it's also the, easiest spec the simplest specification. Um, of a product. Gasoline's a little more difficult. Uh, jet fuel is clearly difficult. You can't pull off the side of the road if your engine starts not working. Um, <laughs> so diesel's an easy one. Is, is the easiest uh, for a small company. So how do we do that? This is really where synthetic biology comes in. Synthetic biology came in and how we build these pathways, but now we've got to take something that makes a little bit, or in some cases a lot, a material and move toward making a lot more. And this is what I think has changed the state of the art of, genetic, of, meta, of, of metabolic engineering and genetic engineering. Because today is different than two years ago, which is different than five years ago, which is different, way different than 10 years ago. But you know, today, the cost of, of as you guys know, of, of synthesizing DNA is so cheap. You can, make, you can order it. You can design it computationally. You can automate the parallel synthesis of different oligos, gene, gene libraries. We've engineered, we have a process now where we can design on a, on, on a computer, you know, a thousand organisms, where we then order the oligos, the oligos come in, we put it into a, in a micro tighter well plate, you know, we've got a complete work list where different genes are assembled in each plate. Those plates are then, you know, can be either put into vectors, and vectors, again, this is all automated, ligation, cloning, transformation, even gene replacements. Uh, so we can design organisms and have all that done, basically through an automated process. Um, and that allows you to um, not be very smart. Because, in fact, at the end of the day, we're not, we know a lot of things about biology, but we don't know as much as we need to know, which means we gotta test a lot more hypotheses, because most of them are wrong. Um, and so what we're able to do now through this automated process in, in synthetic biology is build and test a whole lot more um, hypotheses, quicker, faster, cheaper, in order to find the solution that we need. Because what we gotta do, and again, I don't need to tell you the function of a gene, is this. Here's our cell. This is our template that we're trying to engineer. Um, the cell has to stay alive. This is our catalyst. Uh, but what we're trying to do is convert some substrate to product uh, in this, that complex milieu where we've gotta also get the substrate in the cell, the product out of the cell. We've got this substrate, if competing pathways that are required for that substrate. There's cofactors involved in the, in the pathway that, are going to be, that need to be available versus other pathways. There's byproducts that are going to go off that are going to be contaminants, potentially. Uh, these products will inhibit. There's environmental factors, and it gets more complicated and more complicated and more complicated. And at the end of the day, as you need to engineer these components to have as efficient production of, of substrate all the way to product, you have to, to target genes that are distributed throughout the genome. It's not just one place that you're engineering. You've got to engineer all over the genome, and that's tough. Um, and that's really what synthetic biology allowed us to do. So that means you've got to build in a principal pathway in some part of the genome, but you might, might need to eliminate a competing, you know, a product pathway over here or a competing pathway. You may want to engineer in a new enzyme or pathway into the, into the organism. Ultimately, a, you don't want plasmids. You want, you, you want things that you don't require antibiotics in, in, a, in an industrial process. But ultimately, you want this pathway to be as efficient as possible. And that's really what we've been, we, we've been working on. That's, that's the hard work the really legwork that takes you from an idea to a commercial process. And it's that process that is, you know, where most of the companies out there today are working on. It's working down that cost ladder. So um, one of the things we thought we were going to have to engineer was secretion. Uh, and we didn't have, turns out we didn't have to. We were really lucky. Uh, this is a, if you look at how the, the cells naturally secrete the product, and this creates a really, a, a couple of advantages. 
because it's secreted and it separates naturally, the, uh, the, the product is non-toxic because it's, it's in a separate phase. It doesn't get back in, like ethanol and butanol, you know, you pickle your cell pretty quickly because it's miscible with water. This is not miscible with water. Um, and it separates very, very nicely. Um, and it, truly, if you just let your, turn off your fermenter, turn it off, you will settle and 95% of your material within an hour is in the top you know, 10 or 20% of, of, of the fermenter. Um, you, do, you do get a little bit of emulsion while, while, you're, while you're spinning, as you'd expect with oil, water, and, and protein in cells, um, but it is not a, a stable emulsion. It, 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 it separates here. Um, what we do is then run this through a centrifuge and break that very quickly and get to, to a really nice oil. Um, this is what our process looks like today. It's really simple. Uh, this is our pilot plant. This is a thousand liter fermenter. You feed sugar from here into this fermenter. Um, you mix it. You form your, your product. You take that product. We, we use it just for, for speed. We just run the entire thing through the centrifuge. Uh, we'll get a, a pellet of cells. Water is a heavy phase, and we'll get a light oil phase. That light oil phase is already by itself. can be used for off, uh, off-road vehicles. It, the only issue there is a slightly high, it's a high sulfur content, a little bit of fatty acid, but it's already a good oil. Um, if you add some, you know, basically we use you know, magnazole today, which is probably too expensive long term, but some type of adsorbent, run it through a dry filtration process. We get to uh, what we call our ultra clean diesel. Um, this is what the specs of it. It's, a, uh, it's got exceedingly high cetane. If you compare it to, to petroleum diesel, it's got very, very high cetane. You know, not that that's going to give you value, but you can blend it, uh, blend it in. Uh, normal petroleum diesel is relatively low. No aromatics. We got a sulfur that's already compatible with European specs. Um, again, you compare it to the, the normal uh, suspects from, the, from, from plant, soy, rapeseed, and palm. Again, great cetane, comparable or better cloud point, and we are bringing this down now with branching. And um, again, the oxidative stability is basically off the charts. This is just a normal test. They don't go past six, but uh, we've now tested this. So you know, this, the, what we've had sitting around for over a year hasn't gone, hasn't, hasn't degraded at all. Um, so again, this is ASTM compliant, so it's, we're, and, and it's been registered with the EPA. We can sell this material. It's compliant in Brazil. Uh, it's important because that's where the cheapest feedstock is. And uh, it has very, very high performance in engine testings now. So it's, it's, a, it's a really good product. And this is an ester. People like it. Uh, unfortunately, you have to call it biodiesel, which is, you know, so the alkanes are, are, are close behind. Um, feedstock technology, you know, today we're making it from sugar cane. That's our plan. That's the cheapest sugar uh, on the planet. Um, we're, you know, we've demonstrated our ability to use really just about any feedstock. E. coli naturally uh, metabolizes C5 and C6. We've done the engineering to, to naturally uh, uh, to transport and, and metabolize sucrose. Um, it's the, the, turns out the, hyd the hydrophobicity of the second phase provides an increased tolerance to some of the toxins you see in uh, acid hydrolysates, so some of the, the dehydration products of sugar, the furfurals, et cetera. They're hydrophobic and they partition in, and so there's a higher tolerance. We can get much higher tolerance to some of those uh, toxins. Um, we've done some work with Jay Kiesling's lab for uh, working, moving toward a, uh, a consolidated bioprocess where we take these organisms and then secrete from them uh, cellulases and hemicellulases, um, and it actually worked better than we thought. We, the paper we published in Nature was uh, together um, was pretty academic, it had not really high densities, but it turns out that enzyme was not produced very well, and there's another paper coming out relatively soon that is it, it, surprisingly good. Uh, makes me actually go, wow, this might actually work, <laughs> um, which I, I wasn't sure of initially. Um, but it, Interesting advanced technology, maybe third or fourth generation. Who knows? Um, we often uh, I like this. This is our favorite slide to sort of you know harp on everybody else. <laughs> um, th actually, this is what we think are the best technologies out there, uh, and I think all of them are going to survive and 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 contribute. Uh, there's a lot of technologies that are that are emerging. Um, not any one is going to be the only silver bullet, and there's going to be a, a lot of opportunity. I think for a lot of technologies to provide uh, value and advantage. Um, if you look at the different processes, you've got the, you know, we like to brag about ours because it's a single step production. Um, again, high, high yield for fame is going to be 30% theoretical. These are the theoretical yields. You're going to get, everyone's going to get to maybe 85% of that. You know, we, we aim at, our $50 barrel is uh, based on 85% of that, so it's about 32% uh, total yield. Uh, you compare that to, say, the butanol, isobutanol process, that's got a 41% theoretical yield. But in order to get to, it's a great molecule for gasoline. If you want to get to hydrocarbons and diesel, you've got to distill it, dehydrate it, oligomerize it, hydrogenate it to get down to a hydrocarbon. And that is 
a lot of work. Now, some of these can be condensed into single unit operations, but it's still a lot of catalysts and you need hydrogen. Similarly, for an isoprenoid process, much lower theoretical yield. You produce a polyolefin that you then have to flash distill in order to, and then to hydrogenate. Again, four, four equivalents of, of, uh, of um, hydrogen to get down to a diesel. It's going to be expensive. And again, you have poor yield. Um, triglyceride process and oleaginous organisms. Fatty acid yields, but you have an intracellular product. So these organisms, one of the, I think one of the advantages to E. coli is that it's not a natural oleaginous organism. It doesn't naturally make triglyceride. You, me, right? We eat too many cookies, right? We hold on to our fat for a reason, right? And these cells make fat and they hold on to it, right? Getting it out, it's like giving a cell liposuction, right? It's, it's hard. And, and so this cell extraction process costs you money. It's hard to do. E. coli doesn't actually hold on to its fat. And so for, that's why apparently it secretes it. The, um, so that you have to extract that oil, then you need to transesterify it to diesel or hydrodeoxygenate. And this is basically a cat, cat cracker. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a catalytic hydrogenation process that's relatively intensive, like the UOP process. Great process. It makes you drop in compatible diesel. It's expensive. Um, but I think all of these are actually good, really good processes that are, that are going to get scaled up. So uh, here's where we are. You know, we, we, in 2007, we started producing in the lab uh, our first products. In 2008 and 2009, uh, we, 2008, we built our pilot plant. Uh, we've made lots of material there. Uh, we, last year, uh, or the beginning of this year, we, uh, we, um, had, we acquired a, a demonstration facility in, in Okeechobee, Florida. I'll show you a picture of that in a second. Um, so we've done, got, taken it through, through, through uh, pilot scale. We're going to be beginning our, our demonstration scale uh, in, in Florida this year um, and completing it next year, which should give us the engineering drawings, we believe, to actually design our first commercial plant, which should come online 2013. That's our, that's our goal. Uh, this is our plant in Okeechobee. Uh, this was an incredible plant. Uh, we're using it for demonstration facility, but these are four 200,000 gallon airlift fermenters. These guys built a plant to make uh, nutritional yeast for, for plants, I mean for, for, for cattle based on uh, local sugar cane and uh, cow manure. Wasn't a good business model apparently. This went bankrupt. Uh, we were able to get this, it's, it's about an $80 million facility. We got it for two. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's what the economy, that's the one good thing the economy has been for us. <laughs> the, uh, um, but we're gonna, we're, our demo scale is gonna have about 50,000 gallon per year capacity. This, you know, if we ran these commercially, if we had the feedstock opportunity, you know, if there was actually cost-effective feedstock domestically, then we could run these um, at about 10 million gallons a year. And, and it actually has te uh, cellulosic technology, you know, hydrolysis technology capacity in, in, the, in the facility. We just, you know, we're not sure how to, how to use it yet. So uh, in summary, I apologize uh, for wittering on. But the, uh, hopefully we'll be able to convince you, uh, or at least what we believe, is if you want to get to rapid and widespread adoption, you need cheap adapt, you know, you know, com, com, uh, products that are going to be able to, 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 do, to basically existing products that can go into existing infrastructure. And uh, hopefully convince you that fatty acid metabolism uh, enables that because it's a, it's a great platform for making a diversity of chemical and fuel products um, that are simple, high yield, low cost, um, and that you can tailor pretty effectively. So uh, it's a great team that we work with. Um, that was after we hit a pretty important yield mark, which don't ask me what that was, because um, I can't tell you. So with that, I'll thank everybody for your patience, time, and uh, hopefully questions. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Um, I certainly haven't felt I was smart enough to understand how it's going to be economically viable anytime real soon. Um, the, uh, you know, my understanding is that there's still a tremendous number of, of, of engineering hurdles between, you know, to, to actually make it economically feasible because of the, just, just the, you know, the engineering issues uh, of, of production, capture, and then you've still got the, it's an oleaginous organism that you've got to extract the oil out. Um, so I, I hope 
I, you know, I sincerely do that, I mean that. Um, I think algae has a place, uh, and it's gonna provide an opportunity geographically somewhere. Um, but I don't know what the economics are gonna be, uh, and, and I think they're challenging. I'm sure Chris. EDI will be publishing a 200-page uh, study of algal fuels in the next couple of days on our website. Excellent. And it says that, uh, what's the number? Uh, well, anyway, it, it cites the numbers and the opportunities, and it's very, very expensive. Under the most optimistic scenario. I mean, Steve, uh, Steve Mayfield had a quote, I think, uh, about two years ago or three years ago in Nature Biotechnology that said, we might get to $10 a gallon. Right. Is that photosynthetic? Or is yeah. It yeah. I mean, I, I think the, I, I wouldn't call, the, so what Solozyme does, you know, for fermenting algae or Martech, right, where you, where, you, where you grow them in the dark and you feed them, you know, sugar, I, that's a different that, that's, that doesn't matter, it's just fermentation. And so that's gonna be similar to what I just showed you. So have you guys given up on the eukaryotic algae producers? Do they um, hunting for that, or is, is, there any, is there even any reason to? We haven't focused on it. We, we actually think prokaryotic is actually a better system. It's gonna, you know, we think we'll commercialize faster. Uh, there's less risk. Um, you know, engineering a eukaryotic is, a eukaryote is that much, it's a lot harder. Less genetic tools, more organelles, um, you know, fatty acid metabolism in a eukaryote is a little more complicated, um, but there's also a lot more risk uh, in the in just the commercialization. I think you and I talked about that earlier. Uh, of even in yeast, you know, there's a there's a there's a hype, and I'll I'll, I'll throw the I'll throw a, a you know a match into the fire here. Um, the uh, there, there's a, there's a I don't know what it is. You know, there, there's there's a there's a preponderance of belief that if you want to commercialize a large scale process by fermentation, it has to be yeast. Um, and, and I would challenge that. Uh, I don't know of a single, other than ethanol or, or, or uh, pharmaceutical proteins, uh, commodity, engineer, metabolically engineered product that has been commercialized in yeast, ever. Uh, people have tried for over 20 years. Sanofi Aventis tried with, uh, you know, with, with, the, with, the, with the steroids. Um, that never made it, it was a challenge. Uh, we've yet to see um, uh, artemisinin get commercialized, there's some challenges there. Uh, people have tried a long time. And so, to me, that was a, you know, on the no miracles, that was a miracle, right? If you're gonna metabolically engineer yeast to produce a new molecule and commercialize it, that's never been done before. To me, that was a miracle. So I said, I, I, E. coli, people have engineered E. coli, 1,3 propane dial, we've engineered, uh, I'm, if I'm wrong, tell me. I was just wondering about lactic. La lactic, so lactic acid is the one example, but yeast naturally produced lactic acid. They were engineered to produce one isomer. So they knocked out the, the L or the D, I forget. Um, but that was engineered, but it naturally produces it as a fermentation product. So that's my, that's my, that's, <laughs> um, and, and that's a great, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great molecule. That's a one enzyme system. But you know, one of the advantages of the, with yeast for these really large scale things mm -hmm. is that uh, the contamination problem is, is much reduced with yeast because of the, you know, the industrial strains are so acid tolerant. Yeah. You know, yeah. you can, give them an acid treatment and clear, clean, clean up the culture and actually recycle the biomass on a very... But they still are the largest consumers of antibiotics on the planet. <laughs> <Well>. <laughs> right, you know, and, and so they, they, there's still that. You know, that's like the best kept secret, right, is that, you know, oh yeah, and Virginia Mycin, is, is, there's so much of it being consumed. Um, and that's expensive. It's a lot, it's an expense. Um, you know, the 1,3-propane dial process, they had some issues, but, you know, lysine, 1,3-propane dial, every time you drink a Diet Coke, Right, phenylalanine that goes into a spark team, that's a 800,000 you know, liter fermentation. I want single fermenter, airlift fermenter. Um, so again, this has been done. There, there's no, how do you do it? You know, it's how you design your fermenter. You've gotta make sure, there's, you know, you're gonna get phage contamination, it's gonna happen. But if you design, if you, if you know how to isolate your fermenters in, in, in engineering your plant, that's good isolation, and you take the, the, the one cell that grew, that's, not, that's a, the phage resistant strain that you then reintroduce. And that's what people do in for lysine production for years um, and amino acid production. So it's, it's large scale. I'm not saying yeast is bad. I think it's higher risk. Is that a publicly known? Because I know that the propane dial for DuPont has over, the E. coli has over 100 mutations, right? So and some of those are probably for uh, relation to susceptibility to viruses. So do you, are you working on your own engineering for making them, you know, so, 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 so there, there are known uh, outer membrane proteins that are evolved that, you know, that where uh, viruses attach. And so everybody will, will naturally, you know, will go in and, and engineer those, you know, knock them out so that they're, they're not susceptible. But 
phage have a way. <laughs> and so, you can't get rid of all of those either. Yeah, because as soon as you find it, it's just, you know, it's, it's the life has a way. You know, when, once you get rid of one, there'll be another one. Just like if you, you know, you, you clean your bug and you, you find, sooner or later there's going to be a lactic acid bacteria that is Virginia mycin resistant that's going to get the, 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 the ethanol fermentations as well. Um, mm -hmm. It's just one of those battles you're going to have. I just want to say, I, was, I wasn't going at it from that sort of angle. Oh, oh no, no. The basic bio, because you say there's cobalt dependent enzymes that seem to be for plant in, in the eukaryotes. That there was some evidence of that or not. So, so I, I'm not sure there's I understood a, the question. Like a cobalt in a heat or something. Or a form of huh? Oh, 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 so, yeah, so, so. That was very yeah. speculative that it was cobalt, I believe, right? It's a cold uh, equity work. I guess it's it's a, just making, you think it's all It, it was as good a biochemistry that I, as I'd seen. I mean, you know, they, they did isolate it. I can't remember. Was it? in extracts. They never got a pure protein. They did, oh, I, thought they, I thought they got it pure, and I mean, he said he got it pure, and that they couldn't get the internal sequence. Um, but it may, maybe it was a band on a gel, as opposed to a pure in a tube. <laughs> you know, um, but uh, I, That's just a very different way to do it than a dye iron, non-eating yeah. protein or yeah. something. It's tough chemistry, anyway. Yeah, it's, it's, it, yeah. um, but I, 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 I'm still interested in those. You know, if we can find those, I'd put them in a prokaryote and see if it works. <laughs> Did you integrate these uh, heterologous genes into the, the main chromosome of the organism? Or? So, so um, we do a lot of the work on plasmids because it's fast and easy. Um, once we know it's a, you know, you've locked it in, this is a fixed part, then you want to get it out of the plasmid and move it into the genome. Yeah, um, because I mean, if you put it in the plasmid, you, have to, you probably got some anti selective markers so it doesn't eject the plasmid. Yeah. You, you can engineer your cells. You, you can re antibiotics are, are, are simple markers, but you can also make prototropic markers like knock out, yeah. you know, amino acid biosynthesis, and then stick it on here so that the cell has to grow in order to have. There's there's ways around that because large at, lar at large scale, you don't want to have to use antibiotics, and the and the EPA is not going to like it anyway. <coughs> All right. Everything else. Thanks. Good question.